Hey, what's up? It's Jesko again from AcousticsInsider.com, where I teach home studio acoustic treatment techniques for audio professionals, but without all the voodoo. And in this video, I want to talk to you guys about how to deal with an asymmetrical room, right? So maybe you're setting up a new space, you've just moved into a new room, you're looking at a few options, or maybe you're just kind of working from an asymmetrical room and you're thinking about the treatment, you're getting deeper into that rabbit hole and you're wondering how does it affect how you approach dealing with this space? What are the consequences of dealing with an asymmetrical room? So that's what I want to get into in this video. Okay, so big picture, the answer is pretty simple. With all the steps that you take, you want to be trying or you want to be attempting to recreate symmetry as best as possible should be pretty obvious, right? And the reason obviously is that we're working with two speakers, a stereo setup, and ideally what we want is for each of these speakers to see or to play into a mirror image of the room of the other speaker, right? So that we get a symmetrical response from both speakers. They play the same thing and they what arrives at our ears is the same thing and so that our brain can manage that and recreate a stable and balanced stereo image between left and right with a proper focused phantom center that doesn't kind of shift around as the music plays, right? And in its most basic form, that means looking at three aspects that you can work on to recreate that symmetry. The first one is obviously the room geometry. The second one will be where you place your setup. And then only after that, you really think about treatment. So let's start looking at the room geometry, first of all. Yeah, I know that for most of us, that's not really an option. But ideally, <laughs> obviously, what we want to do is change the geometry of the room so that it once again becomes as symmetrical as possible. Yeah, so think standard shoebox shaped, a, a kind of a rectangular room. And maybe that means taking out walls, maybe that means putting in walls, maybe that means blocking off uh, uh, the third door to your room. Yeah, I don't know how many times I've seen people set up in studios and it's got like three doors. And do you really need three? Probably one is enough. Yeah, so that kind of thinking. You want to you wanna be recreating symmetry as best as possible, if you can, if you have that option. And that is both in shape, which I just mentioned, but also in terms of materials, okay? So let's say you have a room that is pretty symmetrical, but one side is just a single layer of plasterboard, kind of, let's say in a basement maybe, uh, facing the rest of the basement, and then the other side is just hard brick or even concrete. Yeah, so those will respond very differently to sound reflecting off of it. And what you want is to to make those surfaces, those materials as similar as possible in order to recreate that symmetry. And that's really the only way that we're going to be able to get a symmetrical low end response from a room. Yeah, because the low end response is pretty much dominated by the shape and the materials of the room, or rather the standing wave or room mode pattern that gets created within that shape and also determined by the materials it's built out of. So only by kind of recreating that symmetrical shape can we also recreate a symmetrical room mode pattern where the speakers see that mirror image of the other speaker or see a mirror image of the room in, res in relation to the other speaker and thus also a symmetrical uh, room mode pattern in that space. Yeah? So if, the, if the, the speakers don't see a symmetrical room or don't see a mirror image of the other one, they'll also create a different tonal balance at your listening position. But if that's not possible, then the asymmetry in the low end is just something we have to live with usually. Like this isn't something you can really fix or compensate for completely with bass trapping. It obviously gets better the more you do, but in kind of the standard home studio scenario where you just don't have the space to do a substantial amount of treatment, 
uh, you're going to end up with a difference in tonality in the low end between your speakers. And that's just something we have to live with. So then the next stage or the next step of trying to recreate symmetry is to somehow figure out a way to recreate a symmetrical reflection response of around your setup. Okay. And that just means in practice, kind of looking at the overall shape of the room and figuring out where you can place your setup in the room so that your speakers have a symmetrical shape of kind of surfaces around them. Yeah, that's what I kind of call local symmetry. You want to create local symmetry because that will recreate that will create a local symmetrical reflection response. And that means that at least in the kind of mids and going up into the high frequencies where reflections dominate the response, at least in that part of the spectrum, you can get a symmetrical response. But sometimes even that isn't possible. I totally have seen that before. So maybe because of the placement of windows and doors, you may want to, even if the kind of the shape of the room is symmetrical in certain parts of the room, you might not be able to place your setup symmetrically in that part of the room. Yeah, so maybe you'll, you'll end up shifting your setup slightly closer to one wall, or maybe one of the walls ends up being slightly angled on one side, just because that's the best you can do. And just understand that this isn't the end of the world. Yeah, it's, it's not ideal, but that's the reality of home studios. Yeah, it's not ideal, but it's possibly the best you can do. And the thing to watch out for if you can't get local symmetry around your listening position and your speakers is to make sure that at the very least you compensate for any potential volume differences that creates between the speakers, right? That again means messing with the volume on one speaker in order to bring the, the phantom center back into the center of your stereo image and as best as possible creating a balanced stereo image. I've made a video about this that I'll link in the card which which t tells you all about why I do this by ear and I don't use measurements to do this process. It's just much faster and much easier, but it's very, very necessary to to do that as part of the process of setting up your 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 speakers if you can't really get perfect symmetry even locally. So only at that point are we really thinking about treatment. yeah, so the the kind of the big levers to get symmetry you've looked at. So now if all of those, with all of those, you did the best that you can, now we're gonna look at treatment. Again, hopefully you found a spot for your listening position and your speakers with local symmetry. And that at least means that you can also treat symmetrically around your listening position and around your speakers, again, to continue on that path of creating a, a symmetrical response, but now controlled with absorption with diffusion potentially in order to get that mirror image between the speakers. Of course, the rest of the room and kind of any energy that gets reflected back from behind you where the room isn't symmetrical, all that won't be symmetrical between your speakers. But because you've created local symmetry around you, around your setup, and anything that comes back from the rest of the room is delayed just because of the distance the sound has to travel to come back to your listening position, all of that won't be as impactful as the stuff that happens directly around you. Yeah, So we're kind of trying to push the problem of asymmetry back in time, if you will, in the response to, to, to make sure it, its impact is as small as possible. But that's really the gist of it. Yeah, It's a kind of a step-by-step -step process always trying to figure out how you can recreate symmetry as best as possible, starting obviously with the shape of the room, moving through the placement of your listening position and your speakers, and then through treatment as well. But just understand that you don't have to drive yourself crazy about this. Yeah, home studios are by the nature of them being a home studio, just full of compromises and symmetry is very often one of those yeah if it's uh, if it's maybe it's just a a window that is kind of asymmetrically placed or a door maybe there's kind of a, a pillar or maybe a kind of a beam in the ceiling it happens all the time and none of these will break the sound that you're working on in a way 
that you can't work and that you can't get your mixes and your work to translate. Yeah, You want to do the best you can at every step to, to minimize asymmetry, but you also just have to live with what you're given and you have to deal with what you're given. And sometimes that means that you just have to accept that the response will be somewhat asymmetrical. That's just how it is. Of course, this is something that I also show you how to deal with extensively in my home studio treatment framework, my five steps to treat a room and get it to translate, which is my process to go into a home studio and figure out what steps to take in which order, in order for each of those steps to build on one another and to stop you from turning in circles, to make sure that you're actually focusing on the things that matter and you can leave out the stuff that really doesn't matter. So if you want help, figuring out how to approach treating your studio, your home studio. If you're setting up a new home studio, make sure you download my home studio treatment framework at the link in the description. And with that, thanks for watching. Let's get back to learning to trust our ears and having fun making music in the studio. I'll see you in the next video.